Om Dhanur Grihitva Upanishadam Mahastram Sharam Hipasanishita Sandhyaita Ayamya Tad Bhavakatena Chaitasa Laksham Tadevaksharam Somya Vidti Om Shanti Hi Shanti Hi Shanti Hi <coughs> Taking as weapon that mighty bow furnished by the Upanishads Fastened to it the arrow of mind, made sharpened by thoughts on reality alone. Then drawing full strength, O student, release and penetrate the mark, the imperishable Brahman. Om Vedanta Siddhanta Nirukti Resha Brahmaiva Jivaham Sakalam Jagadja Akanda Rupa Stiti Reva Moksho Brahmadvitiye Shrutayaha Pramanam Om Shanti 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 It is the apt and final conclusion of the Vedanta that all is Brahman. Time, space, living beings, and the world. Living in constant recognition of this fact is what is called enlightenment. Brahman is pure and perfect, and one without a second. And the revealed scriptures are the sure and certain proof of this fact. Om peace, peace, peace. Om Satyena, Om Satyena, Labhyastapasa, Yesatma, Samyagyanena, Brahmacharyena, Nicham, Antaha, Shadirehi, Jyotir, Mayohi, Shubraha, Yam, Pashanti, Atayaha, Kshina, Doshaha, Om Shanti, 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 The Atman, the indivisible self in all beings and all things, is realized by knowledge, by moderation, by austerities, and by veracity. All of these constantly cultivated. When the seer beholds it everywhere, then the mind has been freed of all impurities. Seeing it everywhere, existing in everyone, in everything, even here, in this very mind and body. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om. Those selections of sutras from the Upanishads and other Salient Scriptures of India set us off nicely on our class this morning on the Taittiriya Upanishad, <coughs> which is an ongoing inspection of the Upanishads that we've undertaken for the last several years. Prior to that, we had studied the Gita many times. We studied, gone through the Adhyatma Ramayana as a Western culture here with some of its uh, Indian ad adherents that come. And um, we'd looked into the Vivika Chudamani and several other scriptures of Adi Shankaracharya. So we've spent 20 years or so uh, concentrating very deeply on the scriptures of India in that Swadhyaya Jnana Yoga type of fashion because Swami Vivekananda has told us when he came here that it's going to take uh, this swift route to enlightenment uh, called Jnana Yoga. It's going to take some deep study of that, at least to give it one lifetime, so that all of those doubts and the fears and ignorance that rise with them are dispelled in our mind, and we can then meditate easily, naturally. We can then worship with a loving heart, and we can then perform all our actions free of karma in the selfless service but it's going to take some 
work, those churning bubbles of knowledge, wisdom, bits of truth that you find in the Upanishads and other scriptures to work on the mind, the mind at all its levels and, and the human being at all levels of its existence, not just physical as <coughs> we've been taking to here with exercise and healthier foods and so forth, but um, on the level of discovering our inward going energy called prana, which Vivekananda also said was uh, undetected by most of us in this day and age. <coughs> you, without that, I was saying last night, and we were concentrating that, on that in the retreat over the weekend uh, up the Columbia River Gorge near the Wind River Sanctuary, that um, no inner life is going to be possible unless we well, you can put it in two ways. We can get a hold of that prana and take it inward into our inner states of meditation and and spreading light on our dream states and deep sleep states and different ways in which we talk about it. Or, as yoga puts it, just learn to withdraw our outgoing senses from their objects and then possibly, naturally, the prana will become available to us. We'll begin to see things that otherwise are... Uh, being hidden by this covering power of Maya, and, and then eventually, after the coming power, then the distorting power of Maya gets a hold of it. <clears throat> and by then, it's uh, all lost to us, maybe for centuries, maybe for lifetimes. So, so as to say, this prana is very natural to us. We blink, <laughs> we breathe, uh, we go into dream. All these things happen so naturally and easily, but we're not taking stock of it and we're not using our consciousness to observe its various functions and, and then allow it to take us away from outer distractions, the, the 1,000 imbecilities of the mind, Vedanta calls it, so that we get into a state of natural ease. Dis-ease is the lack of ease, isn't it? So all these diseases uh, rise in the mind because of rebirth. Uh, according to Lord Vashishta, that disease, first disease is rebirth. Uh, we could probably embellish that by saying rebirth and ignorance. But of course, uh, there's no other kind of birth really except birth and ignorance. There is no such thing as, as birth in wisdom or birth in truth. You see, because birth is gone when you're in truth. There's no birth or death at all for you. You don't think in those terms. And so we meet these marvelous beings in our life that are like that. They're just walking around as if there's just one existence and it exists at all time, as Ganeshri was reading from the Gospel of Ramakrishna before we started our class today. And so welcome to the live streaming audience and all of the um, dozen or so of you that have gathered here this morning at the SRV Ashrama in Portland, Oregon. And a um, week before last, uh, we were here giving mother teachings. We had the four fruits of life and, and uh, the four boons of life, which are beautiful teachings of Divine Mother Shakti, uh, because it was Durga Puja and Lakshmi Puja following that, so it was a very auspicious time for mother worshippers around the world, of which there are millions now, and mainly due to the advent of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa in the 1800s bringing back this worship of Mother Kali and uh, as his chosen ideal and giving us this add-on, is this great addition maybe. Another thing we've been missing is the God as Mother ideal. Uh, she's always very retiring, very humble, very behind the scenes anyway and uh, prefers to be that way. There's actually a beautiful verses that we sing about mother where that's enjoined Ramakrishnam Jagad Guru Padopadme Toye Shritva Pranamami Mahur Mahur 
pranamami mahur mahur. That's written by Swami Abedananda, uh, one of the direct 16 disciples of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. In the Kali age, the darkness is so thick that he didn't bring eight, Lord Buddha. He didn't bring 12, Jesus. He brought 16, you see. <laughs> Sixteen great souls came. They're called uh, Ishvara Kotis and Nichasiddhas and great yogis, realized souls. Uh, great knowers of Brahman that gather around. And so Abedananda sang this beautiful hymn, Laja Patavrite Nicham. You know, this Divine Mother, Infinite Mother, who is Laja, she's modest, in modest veil. See. O Mother Divine, Sharda in modest veil, save thy children from all trials and travail. Thy heart to Ramakrishna doth remain. To hear his name is constant joy to you. O Mother of the Universe, we salute you over and over again. So he goes on and on like this, you see, in these beautiful verses of adoration to Divine Mother. The first verse of which is Mother Supreme in human form. You don't forget that. He's not talking about some faraway formless ideal that you know, is transcendent compassion. A sort of uh, take, just pick you up and lift you up out of suffering and ignorance because they're unreal. But he's talking more about Mother Supreme in human form because as a boy, his name was Kali, by the way, as a boy, he, Kali was taken by Sri Ramakrishna and given to Holy Mother and said, this boy is very pure, very good, he will help you, uh, serve you, you see. So Holy Mother kind of took him under wing. So he had that great fortune of seeing her and when he saw her and then he served her, then flash ahead to his monkey years later, he wrote this beautiful hymn, O Mother Supreme in human form, grantor of boons and bliss, distress of our souls, removest thou, givest us contentment and peace. Thy children who offer all to thee, do thou makest them content and free. O great mother of the worlds, be our salutations ever unto thee. See? That's how he starts off his hymn to her. So, as my teacher later said, I've heard her voice, I've seen her face, now I long for her grace with all my heart. He said that in his 70s, 80s, 90s. The only time you'd see his face soften at all, give rise to any emotion at all, would be when you mentioned Holy Mother. He, he would all of a sudden be quiet and inward and reflective, and his voice would get softer, and he'd start speaking about the few times he had seen her and the time she initiated him into sannyas. So, very powerful moments in a great soul's life which are paid forward into a culture like this, because when Swami Sheshananda came here to Portland, Oregon and taught, he never went back to India. He's the only Swami I can think of, remember, that didn't return to his homeland after coming to the West. He just gave his whole life to us. See. And as a result, you see what you see here and what SRV has been doing for some 25 years, longer if you consider SRV National, which started back in the 80s in New York, under our founder, Lex Hickson. So those kinds of great teachings are always attending um, spiritual life. But in order to deepen spiritual life, make it more intense, because our founder, speaking of him, was always, he always liked those two words. He liked clarification and intensification. Uh, spirituality is not religion, for instance. It's not just once a week kind of affair or praying over your meals once a day. Uh, it has to, as I was saying last night at our book signing event, which some of you were there at, for the new book, Wisdom Particle, the flows of wisdom particles, you see, that that, that uh, practice is the cutting edge. It's beyond morality and ethics, and uh, it's even beyond Dharma, you see. What we're teaching here is Dharma, basically, to give the Western it's one of our bylaws at SRV. We must try and educate the Western people in the philosoph philosophical teachings of ancient India, all the way up to current times, too, when you have great souls like Vivekananda and Ramakrishna and, and Holy Mother coming and teaching us. So 
uh, then it's enjoined upon us to practice, not just to to uh, hear the truth, shruti, but to roll it over and over in our minds, manana, or yukti sometimes it's called, and then niti jasana, realize it in this very lifetime. <clears throat> As Vivekananda himself said, we were just young boys after the master passed away, and there were m many spiritual organizations all around us just waiting to absorb us, to eat us up. And we were just penniless little young boys, and we, so they rented this haunted house no one else wanted and started their meditations there day by day to follow Ramakrishna's teachings. And parents wanted them to come home, and uh, organizations wanted to nip them in the bud, Vivekananda said. But he said, Ramakrishna had taught us one thing that no one else had, and that was how to actually live a spiritual life. So that's a rare thing. I see a lot of people, I would say, even on up to the level of a practitioner who, whose practice just becomes sort of by rote. Oh, my teacher told me to meditate an hour a day and read a little bit, you see, do some worship once a week or whatever. And the whole thing becomes a little bit like those mundane rounds of human convention and religious convention that are going on all the time that really don't get to the heart of things. First of all, don't destroy your sufferings and, and alleviate your ignorance, your doubts, and your fears and so forth. They still linger and lurk around in the shadows, lurking back there somewhere. See? It's a funny word, lurk. Mm -hmm. Hey, you lurking over there. Get out of my mind. But also don't um, give us that enlightenment which we say that we're interested in, you see, that, that we really uh, must make an all-out 100% effort for in this lifetime. And so all distractions are going to have to get thee behind me. And a true spiritual life is going to have to come forward and establish itself and so that one's impervious to the changes of maya, absolutely impervious with every breath one draws, till one doesn't even know anything else but just higher truth. That's all the mind consists of. That's original mind. Now you've made it back home. Your founder's first book titled it Coming Home. You see, Coming Home. The experience of enlightenment in different religious traditions was the subtitle. You can do it through any tradition, and you can do it through any authentic yoga. The yoga of contemplation, the yoga of action, usually seen as sort of antagonistic of one another, the yoga of knowledge and the yoga of devotion, yoga of meditation, the yoga of the mantra, see, or pick up the Gita and there are 18 chapters and there are 18 different yogas there you can follow, you see. I'll have to bring that chart on the various yogas, which is a big ocean, you see, and then all these waves, and each wave is named a different yoga. And Holy Mother's picture is superimposed behind it, you see, uh, out of which all these paths to union have been uh, emerging from time out of mind. And out of which the Upanishads came, as we, we chanted this morning, too. Uh, Danur Grihitva Upanishadam Mahastra. Mahastra means great. The great Upanishads, you know, Take that as a weapon against maya, against doubt, against fear, against ignorance, against suffering, and uh, put your mind on it after you sharpen the mind with thoughts on God alone. So it's a perfect um, regimen there you're talking about. You just keep your thoughts on God all the time, get rid of those distractions, uh, pick up a scripture like that, and you're reading the truth straight out, and it puts you in samadhi. Uh, sometimes when there were no books and it wasn't written down then you would do the same thing and then the guru would just speak a few words into your ears and you'd go into samadhi and at that moment when he gave you the initiation or the mantra or the mahavakya your lives in ignorance were over see? you were just a, a perfect potter's wheel still spinning see? you know that story Shankara gave is that when the potter fixes the, you know, the wheel up and spins it and crafts the perfectly shaped pot with no angularities, Can't, it looks like a candle in a windless place. The, when, even when it's spinning, it's just perfect. 
then he walks away, but it just continues to spin for 10, 20 minutes, you see. So that's you after you've heard the truth, and the truth has set you free. Your body will maintain itself for a while longer, and maybe you can be of some service to someone. As Holy Mother herself said, you've all heard now of Sri Ramakrishna. You've all found him. He's come in this age with Holy Mother and his disciples. Behold, the Lord has come again. That same one who cried out the message of the Bhagavad Gita on the battlefield of Kurukshetra has come again. Sitaya yor hi Ramaha. You see, that one who is Sita's beloved, Ram, has come again. So now you've heard, you've seen. Uh, now your uh, your problems are all over. You see. Your, your desires are all satisfied. Your karmas are all attenuated. Now can't you help someone else along the way? As you're going to a sure and certain enlightenment in this lifetime, then help someone else along the way. See? Be kind, be gentle, and try and lead others with you in, in a friendly way. See? No coercion, no forcing. It's a natural thing. And if they won't come, then just be the example that you are, you see. As the Upanishad's about to tell us, you see. Meditate on five. Meditate on five. How does it put? The seer who revealed the truth, Having grouped the various objects, declared that the whole universe is based on a fivefold principle and that one set of five preserves the other sets of fives. Mm -hmm. Or as the commentator of the Upanishad, that was the actual Upanishad itself, the commentator says, chanting the common, common Vedic Upanishad in the meter called Pankti, having five feet with five-fold meter, the seer opens up the cosmic vision through this principle of five based on facts known to all. What are facts known to all? That you have five elements, that you have five senses, that you have the same in dream tonight, that the mind, if you study the Vedanta, is five-fold. If you count God's mind or the Mahat in with the four-fold mind, then all sets of fives, you see. And there are five yamas and five niyamas and five-fold maya. Maya is consisting of five parts. And there are five pranas flowing through you. And on and on, the whole philosophy is based on this sets of fives, you see. Uh, so those are facts known to all. But now, what's the very first word of that sloka? I read you the last sloka. Meditate. Meditate on them. So... He's not saying meditate on Brahman, how can you do that? He's not saying meditate on Ishvara, not saying meditate on the mantra. See, all, all of these things are paths to meditation. Do not meditate on emptiness, don't meditate on uh, your Atman. He's telling you to meditate on everything that is here. See? Take it all in in one fell swoop, account for it, track it. Observe it, account for it, see, list it down in your mind so that the mind will then remember why it has five fingers and why there are five elements and how to connect them. And uh, it's a sure way back inside of yourself, you see. When you come to the idea of five pranas, then you know there are five forces that are moving and you can uh, utilize them, grab a hold of them and utilize them. Otherwise, it's all outgoing prana to the five outer elements. And that provides no profound solution. <coughs> we found <coughs> even after you've mastered the five elements, there's, there's no real remedy to your problems. You, see, you still have the decay of the elements and you still have the objects that are made of the five elements. <coughs> so this is how we start into chapter one, lesson seven. And 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, and eventually get to chapter 2, hopefully by tomorrow. We want to look at these. Uh, some of it has a lot to offer us. Some of it is couched a bit in esoteric terminology, so you do need a teacher to 
lead you through it to help you think uh, beyond just the words that flow by. Some of them having to do with Yagya and Hotri and you know the, the priests and and the officiating ritualists and so forth uh, that have long been uh, 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 gone to us to most other cultures and even in India some of this is very ancient lore and it's not being continued in the same way like Sanskrit for instance <coughs> but the fact that they had a hold of the truth and that they realized the truth and then put it down in Sanskrit language makes Sanskrit Devabhasha means language of the gods they call it language of the gods so that there are many words in Sanskrit which are not, do not have equivalents in English and in other languages that immediately recall for us the path to truth. Because of all the many things, sets of fives that are there that we've sort of lost track of, we're not, not only not accounting for them, we're not connecting them. As if everything is random, you see the idea. Oh, it's all coincidental. It's serendipitous, you see. It's the talk of children, not the wise. So the wise know about the interconnectedness of all things, and some people find out about the interconnectedness of all things and then assume that that's all they need to know. But the truly wise, that is the fully enlightened ones, find out about the interconnectedness of all things, like Lord Buddha, he called it Pratitya Samutpata, and find out that once he found out about the interconnectedness of all things, he could get out of it. He could get out of all things. Because Brahman, enlightenment, consciousness, is not a thing. You see. It's not an object, it's not a form, it's not an energy, it's not a thought, even. Not even a highest thought like this. So if you want that one alone, if you want that with a capital T or tat om tat sat om, which is one with the word om and tat, then you will have to find the interconnectedness of all things and then withdraw yourself. You see, withdraw yourself from every wheel and every cycle that's going on, and place yourself back in the original state, original mind. O m om. And then meditate on that state, pass your time contentedly and be free, just like the wheel is still spinning after it's perfected. That's Prabhda karma that's still spinning in you. You don't have any more past karma, you have annulled any possibility of future karma, but you still have this karma that brought you here. And that's the arrow shot out of the bow. You cannot call it back, so you, you live it. How do you live it out? The students asked Shankara, so you can get rid of your past and future karma with fire of yoga. That's practice. But how you can't get rid of your Prabhda karma by the fire of yoga. It's already upon you. So the only way you can you can deal with it is just stay near to Brahman your whole life. Yeah. Families come with uh, mentally challenged children. What do we do? Keep them near Brahman all their life. So you keep them in holy company. That will cause an impression that's separate from the impressions that cause their mental retardation. So you, you can't do anything about a blind man. He can get enlightened, though, and still be blind. See? So if you have something that's unremovable, see it's, the impression is too deep, nobody can remove it, it has to be lived out, then you lift consciousness off it and put it somewhere else and create a new impression. And that's how the wind gets around things. If it can't blow around it, it'll blow under it. If it can't blow under it, it'll go over. If it can't go over, it'll find a chink in it somewhere. It'll get through, you see. And that's that consciousness that's all pervasive. It's already there and in everything anyway, so if you can identify with it beyond the object, why not? Because it's already there beyond the object, you see. That's not just positive thinking, uh, something you put out to make money on, you see, to convince people. When you don't really care for their highest good, you want, you want to route them back into Maya so that they'll pay you, you see. But it, it's actually a, a, something that the wise uh, enjoin upon you, you see. Help them as you go toward your own way, towards truth. Show them how you're doing it. See, show them how it's been accomplished. Leave a record 
like this, Taittiriya Upanishad, or like the Setashvatara Upanishad we studied last couple of years before we started into this. So in terms of teachings that can help us like that, that can put us beyond brooding on our problems, because you know, ignorance, fear, and doubt are the three ingredients of our ignorance, of, of our uh, primal avidya. See? And we haven't annulled those yet and shown them to be unreal, showed them to be empty. Uh, so we still believe in them when we pass from the body. But you're going to have to thin those down, you're going to have to diminish them. And uh, what's stopping you from diminishing brooding and ignorance and fear and doubt is, or, or, is brooding, you see. Ignorance, fear and doubt are increased by thinking about them. Just like the devil becomes real all of a sudden because you believe in it, you see. But there's no insentient incarn there's no sentient incarnate evil out there to get you. Uh, the devil is in Mrs. Jones, you see. It's all inside of you. God is also inside of you, they say. But of course that's in a very big way, beyond a concept of what you say you think of God. So again, you're left with this device, marvelous device called the human mind. And Sri Ramakrishna said it's the gateway to hell, it's also the doorway to heaven, beyond. So it depends on how you use it. <coughs> well, the Upanishads and Rishis of the ancient time, when they were brought out of hiding and put into words and transmitted to children at a very early age and memorized Swadhyaya and then passed on from generation to generation until finally came uh, <coughs> a time when they were beginning to disappear, so someone had to write them down. And Veda Vyas came along and compiled them. That's why he's known affectionately as the father of Vedanta. And uh, he himself had many, many incarnations of Krishna, you know, and wrote these scriptures again and again, <coughs> recited them again and again before they were written. And uh, so had them all marvelously in memory. We were talking about Shankara last night, and we may say Veda, Vyas, Veda Vyas might be too far in the distant path like Krishna, you know, too many myths and so forth grown up around him, so becomes a fantastic figure. But, but Shankara was only back in 700 AD. And he knew all the scriptures by heart when he was a young kid, see, and, and then was teaching graybeards in his teens. So we have on record in recent times a being who demonstrated that ability of Shruti Dara, and, you know, the, the holder of all the essence of the scriptures and able to transmit it to people. Uh, even at a very young age. So that message then coming through the Upanishads even today, uh, you see, you got 40 rupees, oh. you can buy this from me. You see. Mm. Is that even a dollar? It's not even a dollar, you see. So the only expenditure you're going to have to put into an Upanishad is your own study and your own practice of the gleaning this, what, what comes out of the Upanishad. So if we started out with lesson eight, if there are seven, I mean, I'm sorry, lesson one, but uh, a chapter one, but lesson seven. Let me check that to make sure. Yes, that's the one that starts out, meditate on what? On the elements that compose the universe, namely earth, space, heaven, sky, major minor points of the compass, fire, air, sun, moon, stars, water, herbs, tree, ether, one's own body. After that, Reflect on the five forces that flow through the body. Prana, Vyana, Apana, Udana, and Samana. How many? Five. Then what? Meditate on your body. Skin, flesh, muscle, bone, marrow. How many? Five. Then meditate on the organs of sight, hearing, thinking, speech, and touch. Five. 
After having grouped these various objects, then you can declare, like the seer, that the whole universe is based on a fivefold principle and that one si set of five flows from the other and preserves the other at the same time. And which is precisely why nothing ever uh, is born and nothing ever dies. Nothing's ever created and nothing gets destroyed. Because if you can destroy the effect of a thing, its cause still lurks back there, you see. So people can think, I'm going to destroy the world, I hate humanity. So you've got souls like that. So they do everything they possibly can in the outer world. But they have no inward going prana, they don't know where everything came from. They think only in terms of what they can see, taste, touch, hear, and smell. So they destroy the senses of the people so they can't enjoy anything. And they even try and destroy the world itself, air, air, air earth, fire, water, and ether. And after, if they could even accomplish such a thing, they would dance about in glee. They don't know that they just destroyed the effect of a thing, and its cause is still right there, even in them, you see, as they see, taste, touch, hear, and smell the destruction. <laughs> so it's not wake up and smell the coffee anymore, it's wake up and smell Mother Kali. <laughs> she's the eternal goddess that's behind it all. And these sets of fives she's put into motion through Lord Brahma, those are very, very subtle causes. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. I mean, sometimes, again, we even sing about those. In some of our earliest hymns, if you remember, we used to sing this one a lot. Jaya Shiva Omkara Vaj Shiva Omkara Brahma Vishnu Sad Shiva Hara Hara Mahadeva Hara Hara Mahadeva Jaya Shiva Omkara Vaj Shiva Omkara Brahma Vishnu Sada Shiva Hara Hara Mahadeva Hara Hara Mahadeva This is from one of our earliest CDs. Well, it was a cassette back then. No CDs yet. This is how long we've been going at it, you see. So it mentions Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in terms of Omkara, and that's actually the next verse, or two verses away we'll look at today, the, this word called Omkara. But first, since the first word is meditate, I thought I'd call back an old war horse called meditation, because I consider it a very valuable chart, because in my own case, my teachers never taught me how to meditate. And I don't think really, I think it's because meditation can't be taught. It's something very natural and particular to each individual. Each individual soul means in each individual mind, because mind and soul are one. Uh, if you talk about soul with a capital S, that's beyond the mind, or original mind. But however you look at it or describe it, this, this very important element of inner contemplation or meditation or equalizing the vrittis, you know, cutting out the mind's waves, sitting in peace and silence, however you want to put it, the word dhyan yoga it comes out. Te dhyan yoga, nugata apasyan, right? Mm -hmm. mm. Devatma shaktim svagunair nagudam. They saw the devatma shaktim through dhyan yoga, through meditation. Mm. They did that after they got this wisdom, after they satisfied their daily uh, and, and lifetime needs, you see. There's a, a good teaching on that here that I will probably come upon as I go into it. But basically you're supposed to be able to satisfy, you know, the, the rituals and rites and, and have progeny and make uh, uh, what they call uh, um, artha, see, right livelihood, make your money through right dharmic means and so forth, satisfy all these things and then the desire for liberation can come upon you without impedance. If you don't do those things first, get those sort of satisfied, then it's going to be very hard for you to concentrate on 
the one single aim of true aim of life, which is enlightenment or moksha or mukti. Uh, that's why Christ had the rich man go go back and give away his wealth, and before he could follow him, because he knew the man would be thinking about wealth all the time, and that camel would not pass through the eye of a needle. So this teaching, I consider uh, a, a sort of good effort to put into words and in categories the ways that people can meditate, um, because it really isn't told in such a way by people, by teachers that is. Um, so I started thinking about it and I thought mm, this would be a great way to present it to people, these two types and five kinds of meditation. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, eight types of meditation. So you see, really, to understand meditation, you have to know that there are two kinds, and we would call that, in our language, form and formlessness. So if you're doing any of these types of meditation, which we can run through quickly, then you're engaged in in Saguna Brahman meditation. You see on the sidebar there, uh, meditation, meditating on God with aspects or with attributes, with gunas, with form, with name. And most of the teachers say that's a path for a greater percentage of humanity. So they're going to have to take an ideal or a form and meditate on that. And that's going to get them to the Father through the Son. You see, that was also the implication of that statement that Jesus made, is that most beings are going to have to have an exemplar. Uh, hopefully don't turn him into a savior that you're depending on, but rather an exemplar that you're following. That's how my teacher would describe it. Yeah. And uh, don't turn it into just a spiritual organization like a church, but find a teacher because the church tends to replace the teacher. They asked Shankara once in a while, uh, once upon a time, he said, what's the one thing to be avoided? And he said, a congregation without a leader. So in spiritual life, you must find that teacher who can be an example to you and can transmit to you the truth. That's called stotria. It must transmit to you the truth, the essence of the truth, and have no other desire for you, that's called a kamahata, without desire, and can do it from the position of a pure and sinless existence, that's called a brijana, an uh, uh, unostentatious life, lifestyle. And all of those three based upon being a knower of Brahman, has to have had direct experience of what Brahman is. So all of that would apply more uh, at the end of that, the result of that, would apply more to these types of meditation that are formless. So, it's not just enough to eat sugar. They asked my teacher that once. Ramakrishna said, some like to eat sugar, some like to be sugar, which is higher? You see. And uh, everyone says to, they, they would prefer to eat sugar, because that's, you know, enjoyment of God. So that's God with form. There's no enjoyment in the formless Brahman. There's just unalloyed bliss, a peace that passes all understanding. <laughs> There's no separate knower to enjoy. Or, you know. So then I think I'd rather be eating sugar. And my teacher was silent for a minute and he said, well, they say that because very few know the bliss of being sugar. If they knew the bliss of being sugar, of being one with God, I and my father are one, then they might modify their opinion a little bit, you see unalloyed, uninterrupted bliss as compared to, oh, there's my exemplar. Oh, he just disappeared from the body. He's been gone 2,000 years, what do I do, you see? Is that unalloyed, uninterrupted bliss? So, dependence on forms, no matter how high, how deep, how beautiful, how profound, is risky. See? But you can always depend on the formless reality. And more, all the more because you are that formless reality. You find your true self. Forget about your true calling. Find your true self. That is your true calling. And any calling you hear prior to that is going to be what they call the clarion call. You see, the clarion call—that that 
once that silent voice you see this back inside you that all of a sudden says now's the moment this is the lifetime it's upon you right now here's your opportunity don't let it get away again because how many cycles will go by before this opportunity presents itself again so you don't want to develop a habit of spiritual menu tasting see or gathering merit badges of different mantras or bouncing around from teacher to teacher. The Zen Buddhists say, that's wild fox Zen. What you want is to find that teacher that's the right exemplar for you, dig in, dig deep, one well. Digging many shallow wells, you never find water. What you want is that deep well that you've dug with your own hands at a place where the man with the divining rod stood you see, he told you, dig there. You'll be a fine if you just keep digging there, you see. And you dig as you get rid of the all the overlays of maya, you see, and you dig down deep. So this is what meditation helps facilitate. In fact, meditation is pretty much at the end of the trip. It's the end of the journey. It's the last thing to mature in most beings. That is, they may try and meditate, but I've always said that. You can't meditate, you can't uh, study, and you can't worship in the right spirit until this ignorance has gone out of your mind. How can it be? How could it possibly be true that anyone could get the pearl of great price when they have any defect in their vision at all? How are they going to make sure that that's the pearl of great price? You see, So you're going to have to rem make thine eye single and remove all false gods, all false uh, overlays, all false superimpositions. And the guru will walk up to you one day and say, here's the calarium, and you'll spread it on your eyes and all of a sudden you'll see, you see. This Upanishad says, the panacea. It's called the panacea, it's the remedy of all problems. And the remedy beyond all other solutions is that dependence on, full dependence on the one. Call it Brahman or Shakti either way, because Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Brahman, which is, you know, this, and Shakti, this, you might say, are one and the same, like fire and its heat. And, then, uh, and uh, water and its wetness, see, snow and its whiteness. You can't really separate those out. Snake and its wriggling motion. He used to say that a lot. Sometimes it stays still, sometimes it wriggles, but it's the same snake. So, as we were saying last night at the book signing event, there's this division between external and internal in us. You're born in the external, you don't know where you came from, and somebody mentions one day, you know, get a life. It means get an inner life, see. And so you say, well, I think I will, and you start trying to meditate, as I said, and you start studying some, you go to a few teachers and so forth, and so you, you make a, a few uh, forays, you see, open a few nadis, nerve endings up into the inner worlds, into the kingdoms of heaven within you, and you have some moderate success maybe, but now you find out you've got this problem, because then you come upon a teacher who's teaching you Advaita, non-duality, now you have this problem of having created a, a, a line of demarcation between the outer and the inner, Maya matramidam dvaita dvaita paramataha. Anyone who thinks there's a division or a line of demarcation between God and mankind is deluded. Thou art that. You are the darling of your own worship. That's how the Tantras put it. You're running around worshiping here and there and so forth, but you are the darling of your own worship. And uh, that that one indivisible self and all. So not the individual, the indivisible. See? You're, you're, you've got a separation in the individual, outer and inner. So now you're supposed to put those into one and meditate on that as if they were one, even though it looks like two. And when this this amalgam happens, you see this natural synthesis. This divine alchemy that Sri Ramakrishna talks about begins to happen, uh, then you know, you'll find yourself in that perfect state of oneness or not two-ness. And uh, this teaching of the fives, you see, is, is meant to 
lead you directly straight back there. I mean, you've got problems with pleasure and pain. See. So then you say, well, I think I'll just concentrate on the sources of pleasure and pain, the five senses. See. And go beyond twos to fives. Take numbers out of the quotient, you see, and then all of a sudden you amass the senses and there's no more pleasure and pain for you. you see. Here, everything begins to take an inward turn. And uh, then you find there are other sets of fives which you can do the same method by. See, it's just like ancient Sankhya Yoga, Sankhya Yoga. Twenty-four cosmic principles. Later on, it was the five sheaths. Before that, it was the three bodies, three three bodies and three states of mind. You go bouncing around in India for its different phases of time to find out there are all these methods that they used in different times that that applied in and helped people of that particular time. And as I said, meditation is always there, uh, but um, as in any good successful endeavor, you should put everything in place first. And meditation is all the more uh, important to do that. Set it all up so that the medit when you first sit in meditation, it'll be successful the first time you try it. Otherwise, you keep trying and failing, trying and failing, backsliding, one step forward, two steps back, and then pretty soon your mind is telling you, well, number one, he'll never do it. Number two, maybe it can't be done. Number three, maybe there's nothing to meditate on. Maybe there's no reality. Maybe all there is is just the five elements and the five senses, and I should just leave it at that and give up spiritual life altogether. And therefore, you've let down hundreds and thousands of realized seers who have come here and tried to help you reach that state. You see, all their efforts, all their suffering, pouring their full life force into that ocean of Shakti in order to fortify it. So that when it comes your time to, to uh, approach the gates of non-duality, you, know, you can do it without any impediments, with the least amount of impediments in the way. So this is what meditation on an object can do. It says here, what, on earth, on the points of the compass, you know, east, west, north, and south, and northeast, north, northwest, and so forth, you meditate on space. And it's all, it's all, all directions, you see. That's where these meditations like, oh, I send blessings in that direction. I'm going to send blessings in that direction. I'm going to send dressing, you know, you see. Sit down and just send blessings to everyone everywhere. Uh, but of course, this is outward. See. Inside, there's no compass, you see, except Brahman. So it, it's an all pervasive in your dream and so forth. From then on, there's no east, west, north, and south. You're not seeing in the dream, how do I go west, you see. It's like being up in space, you see. Where is west? In fact, I think I'm standing upside down where I was, you see. So when it says meditate on objects, sky, fire, air, sun, moon, stars, water, herbs, trees, one's body, then this is what is the point behind pratika, pratima jan. Vivekananda has uh, a good version of teaching the basics of that at the beginning of Raja Yoga, that that eight-limbed yoga commentary he gave us, which is very, very slim down and easy for Westerners to understand because Raja Yoga is the most comprehensive system ever I found, most complicated, most to it, uh, except for Tantra, but Tantra was never cohesed into a system. It was just too vast. So it's not even listed as a darshana, really. It's just this god with form, you know free-for-all, you see. It's a God with form free-for-all. The only only point to make about it is, you know, when you get into the free-for-all, make sure that you worship everything. That's its one rule, you see. Whatever you see, worship it, you see. So that's the tantras is for you. It doesn't matter what it is. You know. Well, there's the poisonous snake. I worship you. you see. There's the alcoholic. I worship you. you see. There's the tavern. I worship you. Just deify everything. 
Renunciation is not condemnation, it's deification. To really renounce a thing, you give it permission to be as it is, but you just transcend it, you see, because it's not what's holding you. So you don't condemn anything, that's not the way. You deify it. That's the tantric way. So when you do a meditation on a, on a, a point of matter, a piece of matter, you say science might have been doing that, you see, but it, it wasn't doing it to find out the cause uh, that it knew of, you see. It was doing it for other reasons. Uh, it even left the laboratory of just mere observation, and it began to become, oh, how can we use this to make money in a utopian society, which Lord Buddha said was not possible. That's why he gave you the first noble truth. There is suffering here, and if you can't accept that, then you can't be a Buddhist. You can't follow my path. It's sort of like Christ saying to the rich man, you know, there is emptiness here, so you can't follow me without giving up your idea of money. See? It is Buddha's time, Christ's time, 550 years apart. See? So they, they had different people with different temperaments there following them, so they had to put it in those ways. So there is suffering, you see. In Christ's time, there was no suffering for, for the fishermen along the river. So just Fishes, loaves, bread, wives, nets, sunshine, an opulent land. That wasn't really much suffering there, you see. But they didn't have an inner life. They didn't know about their prana. They didn't know what made the fish swim, what made the river flow, what made the sun shine, what made the wife attractive, you see. They didn't question it. Should they question it? Yes, they should in the right way. They should question its cause so they can find out the cause of those things so that they can have it eternally. See? That's why Christ made that very disturbing statement that many of the Christians won't even touch nowadays. Those who uh, love their life, they will lose it. Those who hate their life, they will gain it again in eternity. See? You have to hate your life to get eternal life. It follows Patanjali's teaching. The fifth and lowest hell in yoga is clinging to life, clinging to this individual station, this ego that's got its house and its home and its knowledge and its car and its car wax that won't let water in, see, because of some scientists that, you know, started measuring in nanometers, which thankfully brings me back to where I started, you see, so I can go on. <laughs> when you're meditating on an object, um, then you take a bit of matter, you see, Reminds me of my teacher saying, no mind, no matter. No matter, never mind. If there's no matter, like in deep sleep, never mind. You see, There's nothing to worry about. You're fine in a form of state. But if there's mind, there's matter. <laughs> That's a problem, you see. Where there's mind, there's matter. So take a piece of matter. That's what this is. By meditation on those objects which are most agreeable, the yogi's mind attains blissful equipoise. So try a statue of the Buddha, or a little baby Gopala, or baby Ram, Ramlal, see. Whatever your tradition is, or it will afford you, you know, some symbol in stone, or even a plastic crucifix, is that's all you have, you see. You deify it, tantrically. See, this is how my mind will concentrate on God, who is so vast I have no, oppor no possibility of knowing it. So I'm going to slim it down to the simplest common denominator and deify that little thing there. See, Now there have been on record in our tradition, Ramakrishna, some of his women disciples, one particular, concentrated on the statue of baby Krishna. And before she met Ramakrishna, was going all around India, shaved head, you know, looked like a man, just everywhere. And uh, you know, finally came to this the, uh, uh, the river near the Dakanesha temple and, and, you know, worshipping baby Gopal, and it started to come alive for her and run around. And she'd try and catch it and feed it and, you know, clean it and so forth. Finally, it ran away to the Dakanesha temple, and that's how she found Sri Ramakrishna. Mm -hmm. So she worshipped this Pratika, this Pratima, all this time with great devotion, you see. And uh, then it led her to the real thing, as it were. So take, a, take an object. Uh, 
uh, whatever Patanjali says, whatever is pleasing to you. See, it could be a picture of your guru, it could be a stone obelisk, uh, uh, it could be something that reminds you, like Sri Ramakrishna used to keep on his wall a picture of the Himalayas. Whenever he looked at that, he got very high, you see. Walking in the Himalayas, you see, very sacred mountains. Anything that has that sacred association. And, you know, if you're somewhere and you don't have a Himalayas, <laughs> and you don't have any higher ideal, then uh, take a Coke can, set it up, and meditate on it. <laughs> if you're down in the slums of the city, you see. One Swami told me once, well, you might not get the mantra right away, but you can say Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola over and over again, and your mind will become you know, one-pointed for as long as you say that. And that's brooding, isn't it? It's the mind becomes shatavadana, scattered over many things. Shatavadana means thinking of a hundred things at once. It's popular nowadays. It's called multitasking. <laughs> See? But basically, it's fragmented mind. And uh, you can get very facile and very good at it, moving your mind across a periphery of things. But those things are all unreal, is the problem. If you get very facile moving your mind across the teachings of the Dharma, that's much more profound, you see, much more beneficial for you and for others and for those around you. And how you, how you get to the path of truth through knowledge, Jnana Yoga. You, you've, taken, you've taken it away from avidya, you see, or... Um, uh, apara vidya, lower knowledge, with all its very secular pockets, and you've now taken it to para vidya, just the supreme knowledge. Para vidya may not yet be full realization of Brahman, but it's Dharma at its highest understanding, as one way it's described and defined. <coughs> So Pratika Pratima Jan uh, will be effective. Now try Sukshma Jan, and it's what I was actually just talking about, meditation on the subtle truths. Vashishta says, to come to know the methods of removing desire and how best to worship the teacher, the seer studies those scriptures which treat atmic reality and which point to self-cognition. So looks for, is gone from bits of matter, bits of knowledge bits of words, bits of sentences, and now finds those to be very impelling and very intriguing. See, I can put a few of those together in a sentence and meditate on that. Like, how about this one? Meditate on the Lord as thine own self seated in your heart. Are you in Samadhi yet? Has all the world gone away? Are you back to your peace of mind, equanimity of mind? Meditate on, your, on the Lord as your own self. You don't have to go to church or look up in the sky or fear the devil or go to a, a guru and you know learn a, a thousand things. Just meditate on the Lord as your own self. So that's how to put together a few words like this was, right? One little object that, that enchants you, that pleases you, so that you can spend more time in peace and free of distraction, free of brooding free of habitual concerns that take you away from your true nature. So that's the same thing here. You just shift a dimension away from matter and objects, and now you've applied the same principle to subtle truths. That's how I did it, meditation. So you have four yogas, three of them pretty familiar to me. Meditation, difficult. See, Ten years of meditation, I'm not getting anywhere, you see. Twenty years, well, maybe took a long, long time, you know, to pick up the, that subtle art of meditation and make real use of it, you see, where you thought that you were really ha were getting the gist of non-dual meditation and so forth. But how I started all into it was because I mastered, to a certain degree, the cello, you see. My father made me practice. Practice was the cutting edge. He didn't just walk up to me and say, would you like to play the cello, son? You see. <laughs> And I said, yes, Dad. Then he got me one, and it sat in the corner for two years. So it wasn't enough just to get one and have one in the house, you see. I had to begin practicing. Then I practiced for a year, and I went to join the Portland Youth Symphony, see. And the conductor said, oh, you play very well for a year. Marvelous. 
but your position is all wrong. You need a teacher. See? So he sit, took me away from the teacher that was teaching me all wrong, mm -hmm. and and you know put me with the teacher who was a masterful teacher. And uh, so that's my little story using a personal example of how to do this this kind of meditation. You see, I used concentration on the cello later to concentrate on God. It was the same concentration. I just replaced cello for God. You see. I see God, uh, yeah, I placed a cello for divine reality. And as a result, music became divine. <laughs> so, so it works both ways, you see. The key turns in the opposite direction, you see. You're, you're looking for one thing and you get both in that, in that kind of endeavor. So concentration is basically what's being talked about there, but this is on, on matter deifying it, and this is on these subtle truths that are buried inside the scripture and the scriptures are buried inside of you see this is the important thing you just pick up a book and say oh that's new to me you've already uh, transgressed the truth you see because that scripture is in you the paper is in you the ink's in you the book is in you <laughs> see there's no doubt of that because earth goes with smell and smell goes with dream senses and dream senses go with mind so you can trace any piece of matter back to yourself, you see, fives, right? So that's already a given, you should know that. Every, everything, all objects came out of you, not out of God, and nature couldn't do it alone. Had to have the mind as a participant, the activating power, the animating power, you see. Then you can say, but actually the wisdom that's in the book of ink, paper, and wood, and trees, and everything that's there. Why well, you med meditated on trees here, right? Oh, actually trees are books. The, at least they are for a little while. Now they're chips, you know. And the trees are going, Phew, glad that's over. <laughs> <laughs> so, you find out that the actual wisdom its origin is in you. Not just in some seer who made it available to you because he had realized it was in him or her, but you too are uh, uh, part of that great mind, see, out of which all this wisdom, and that's the deep sleep state. And that's where all seeds are stored. So all the seeds for this wisdom are stored in the deep sleep state, which you have access to every night, and which you go into very naturally as meditation. I didn't include that as a meditation here, but in a sense, down here, when you get to Laya Chintaya Jan, you, you're kind of in that kind of, med that, that kind of meditation, you see, um, where you're dissolving everything back in, and, and so you have that realization. But before we get onto it, we're still in the create realm, you see. Create realms, Saguna Brahman, this dotted line is we're, leading, we're heading towards formlessness. The third kind is Vyakti Upashnajan, meditation on God with form. Now you're getting down to the essence. You're not just, say, meditating on the picture of the guru. You're actually going to the guru and meditating on the guru itself, like people who would see Sri Ramakrishna and so forth, and sit right in his presence. Mm -hmm. Or Swami Vivekananda when he came here. You know, you're in the, you're in the presence of a great son, and I can tell you for certain there's no darkness around a sun. You'd have to be very far away from a sun to find darkness. So these great suns are shining with the wisdom, with the light of wisdom all the time. So Swami Shivananda, that is Ramakrishna's devotee, Tara, said, <coughs> for, many of it, for many it is best to think of God as possessed of qualities and having a form. This way their minds will become easily concentrated. So that's where God with form is, is very beneficial. Don't worry if the non-dualists are coming at you and saying, oh, this and that, you see, you're already that. The great teachers never said that. Say, you're not Brahman until you realize you're Brahman. This is what they say. And you can't just assume that you're perfect when you've got all these apparent imperfections in the way. You're going to have to practice. And otherwise you're going to end up with a pseudo-advaita. You're going to do a very great disservice to non-duality if you don't prove the inner perfection by removing these imperfections. And you know, the great souls are doing that all the time. They took on a body, that's an imperfection, you see. And they took it on, so to show that you can take it on and transcend it, 
They have five senses too. They eat their food too. They sleep too, you see. But they all take it in an entirely different direction. Man has come to me from a land that never sleeps. So the body may lay down, the mind is just going all the time, you see. And it's not going in restless cycles. It's thinking about this. When I was at our founder's deathbed in his bedroom in New York, I walked in, or actually I heard this story. His wife walked in and said, what do you think about up here all day? You know, waiting for death, as it were, because he had cancer. And like I said, two things, I think about food. And then second, I think about how to share this teaching with others. Food means I'm thinking about rebirth. I have to take a, food is the foundation of everything here. So food is, you know, what the fetus will survive on. Food is what the mother eats to form the fetus. Food f forms sperm and ovum. Food is it here. So if you're thinking about food, then you're, you're thinking about coming back. But why is he coming back? Because he had everything he wanted in his past lifetime. And he practiced four different religious traditions. He guided the Sufis, he guided the Zen Buddhists, he guided the Vedantas. So that's why he's coming back, to do more guiding, to do more sharing. Uh, so uh, I'm thinking about how to make this wisdom more accessible to more people, you see. So it's going to be very efficacious, so don't worry about it. I'm saying don't worry about it being a crutch. It's not a crutch, it's an aid. God with form is an aid. You need friends in high places, see. You might have noticed here, on all walks of life, financially, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, you need friends in high places to get you where you want to go. So there's no shame in taking that aid. Just as we say, a savior doesn't become a, a savior. He, he should stay an exemplar to you. You shouldn't depend upon that, but depend. he wants you to depend upon your own self because your own self is the same self in him and in all. That's the one thing you need to know is that drop of all the lines of demarcation between matter and spirit, creature, creator, God, and mankind, they all have to go so I can be in this one state of homogeneous awareness at all times that defies sleep, that defies ignorance, and that puts death to death. Makes fear afraid of itself, puts death in its own grave, as my teacher used to tell me. So that's vyakti upasana jan, a fancy word, you know, vipassana, upasana, all these are kind of become famous, uh, or, or not famous, but at least well-respected and followed ways in Buddhism and Vedanta of people who are progressing either with form or beyond form. And this last one is one that I think people don't take stock of very much. I think most conventional religions are doing it because Leela Dhyan is just meditation on the avatar's divine play. And of course, if you think there's only one avatar and it just comes once, then you don't have a lot to meditate on. Or it gets, you know, corroded over thousands of years. But if you think that there's uh, one avatar and it comes many times, which is more the truth. You see, the same soul comes many times because all of these souls were one and they came many times. So why shouldn't it be even more true for the divine incarnations? So if you think that way, then you have a lot to meditate on. So the Christians, their meditations are spilling out in their lawns at Christmas time. You see, little plastic Christs that glow and manger scenes, and you see, that's a Leela Jan in the commercial sense, you see. <laughs> and, uh, you know, be kind of nice to see someone sitting out there meditating on that one night in the snow, you see. Vivekananda meditating on the manger scene, you see. Everyone else is just yawning, passing by, oh, it's commercialism, visiting us, oh, look at the Christ was born in the manger, and it's just like going into this whole inner thing, as if the thing was just an artifact, you know, that suggested something much deeper. Well, that's Leela Jan, and the more fresh it is, the better, I think. Beings like Christ, fairly 2,000 years ago, Buddha 2,500 years ago, anything before Buddha, kind of hard to assign a date to. 
but uh, you know you can meditate on uh, say Ramakrishna Lila like we do see and I could sing you a, a whole song see about that um, about the Ramakrishna's divine descent with many verses written by this man in Hindi in India who's still alive that all have to do with uh, his father and his mother and how he was born and how when he was a baby he his mother left him alone and you know he crawled into the hearth and the ashes got all over him and she came out and found him and he was smeared with ashes that's an emblem for Shiva you know all these things that happened to Sri Ramakrishna as he was growing up his baby and everything all in that song so even just to take it and sing it is a kind of Leela Jan and then of course it quaints your mind with the play of God when it comes here rather than the suffering of God if you happen to emphasize the crucifixion and you know, pretty soon it becomes God died for our sins and shed his blood for our sins. Well, Vivekananda said about that, I don't, I don't like that uh, kind of thinking. He said, I, would, I will die for my own sins. I will shed my own blood for my own sins. I don't want anyone else doing that for me. See? In other words, why make your Savior have to save you for 2,000 years of shedding blood? That's a lot of blood, you see, and a lot of pain. Wake up right now, and you won't have to make him suffer anymore. What about that? See? What about just doing what he told you to do? Become one with the Father. Get out of laying your head here. Birds have nests, foxes have holes, but you have no place to lay your head here. What do you think he meant? See? You can't worship mammon and you can't worship God and mammon at the same time. What do you think he meant? I have not come to bring peace here. I've come to bring a sword. So what do you think he meant? Uh, and then realize that and, and you know, uh, don't just become a Christian, become the Christ, walking on two legs. Might be an odd thought, but we have people in prison walking up to me and saying, you're my Christ, Babaji. I said, well, I may have long hair, but it takes more than looking like Christ to be Christ. You have to actually go through this enactment. And part of this enactment is knowing the Leela Jan. You see, knowing the, the, uh, Leela means play and Jan means meditation. So you're meditating inside and you can spend hours doing this, you see, on the Lord's play and all its facets. And it's much like this. One should meditate on the elements, sky, major points of the compass, sun, moon, stars, water. Science has done that, but it hasn't done it in the way that the Upanishads and the Rishis want it done. Hasn't done it with concentration on the essence that's behind it. They're concentrating on the thing itself as if it were real. But all things are empty. They're empty of substance. In other words, the substance of this object is vibrating particles, changing at a billionth of a second. They're also empty of the, the ability to fulfill you. But you still keep grasping after them, you see. Grasping matter, losing grace. Strange indeed, this human race, mm -hmm. that it would do that, you see. And it's also empty of the, uh, any fulfillment for you, you see. It's going to get stolen, it's going to decay, it's going to stop working. Don't you do that, microphone. Not right now. Knock on wood. And so many other things are going to happen to the object. So. In that way, then, you know, you, you uh, trace it back to its source, its eternal source. And that's what you're doing with Leo Jan. You're not just having a sort of, you know, vacation with God in some dream, you see. But uh, you are concentrating on all these aspects when you do that. I mean, you're concentrating on a person who knew all these aspects who did it. He knew what earth, water, fire, air, and ether meant and what their cause was. So if you meditate on the... Seer, the Upanishads stay, say, you get what's in the heart of a seer. And that's why India has brought, in this day and age, the mantra, okay, and, and the ishtam. They say, the Westerners will not have time to do all this. See, How do we help them save themselves? By giving them the mantra and the ishtam. Give them a great soul who has reached the goal, and then 
the name of that with the power beads of ancient India, like Om, Krim, Shrim, Klim, Krim, Hum, Fat, Svaha. See, and uh, if they meditate on that mantra that we've given them, it with their lips moving, and their minds are thinking about the energy of prana going to the heart, and in the heart there's a lotus, and on that lotus is sitting Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa or any other great ideal, then that's cut to the chase stuff. See? Then if you find out that there are things still in the way, you're going to have to go back. That's my point. So you're going to have to go back and meditate on water because you're afraid of water and you drowned in your last lifetime. And it's, a, it's causing a barrier, a subtle barrier that you don't even know about. So you're going to go have to find that and face it off, neutralize it. There's, you know, a construction crew that got out there and put a detour, detour in the road, you know, that you were supposed to go. I'm sure you're finding that out to be the case nowadays on almost everywhere you go. Uh, so it's a very good analogy of how there are blockages, grunties they're called, in all the nerve passageways. Not just in, you know, food to, to organs and diseases that come because of knots, but inward, you know, inwardly too, there are blockages that you can't get by. You're going to have to, like the wind, find a way around them somehow. So those four, as I meditated on this well, three or four years ago, I you know, thought that's kind of the key points of God with form. Um, the symbol, knowledge, uh, the form of God itself, and the play that it engaged in, he, she engaged in when it came into the body. In the most recent incarnation we can think of, like say Ramana Maharshi or great souls like that, who are very recent. There was a, there was a uh, story I have in prison, I was talking about prisons, this woman came to me and said, oh, this cellmate, she's giving me such a hard time. See, I can't live, it's worse enough, bad enough to be in prison, but she's making my life hell. She defecates in my shoe and, you know, she just, just horrible. So what do I do? So I said, Mother, what does she do? <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> and it came to me to say to her that uh, um, think, uh, meditate in this style. You see, meditate on Mahatma Gandhi and when the English came into his country. Meditate on Dalai Lama when the Red Chinese came to Tibet. You know, your problems are tiny little shit in a shoe. So what? You see, wash it. Uh, you know, grow up. Get over it. But can you get over that? What Mahatma Gandhi had to go through? Isn't that your meditation on nonviolence, what he did? A recent example of a Mahatma Gandhi? Mahatma, great soul? Whether he was or not, people will disagree on, but you know, because he was a lawyer too, and who's ever heard of a great soul being a lawyer? <laughs> There's a lawyer joke somewhere in there. But in my lifetime, I've known two very honest and great lawyers that I know. So of course, there's exceptions to every rule. But um, so she meditated like that. You see, meditate on what it took to see a whole nation uh, that you were in control of, you know, basically get co-opted for another country's usage and all the death and suffering that happened, you see. And so I came back a couple of months later and I said, well, what happened with that? And she said, oh, uh, they came and moved her to another cell. Mm -hmm. um, that was going to probably happen anyway, you know, but the quicker you get beyond the problem itself and even beyond the problem that created uh, the, you know, the solution for the problem too, the sooner mother will move things, mm -hmm. see. Because you yourself are standing there causing blocks when she's trying to work, you see. Must be very frustrating to be the mother of the universe. <laughs> Lead you toward the light and as soon as you get there they, you put you know, problems in your own way. Well, you were just about to see it. 
and I work so hard. So she has to be modest, retiring, humble, patient, all the qualities that Holy Mother loved. Patience, perseverance, purity. She loved the peas, you see. So we've worked our way through this first half, and we only made uh, one word progress. Sorry, in your punch. Meditate. <laughs> it's how to take one word and unwrap it. And, uh, but all the ideas around it you know, are there in the sloka. We'll take that up when we get back after the break, and we'll look at formless meditation because in a country, in a culture where, <coughs> and India inclusive now, uh, where religion has become quite um, ritualistic, dogmatic, you know, plotting. Uh, a lot of people are beginning to lean towards formless meditation. Oh, get me away from this! You know, I need the, I need the pure, quick route. You know, it's, a lot of that is not just the quick fix that the Westerner is looking for, but it's an actual desire to breathe f the air of heights, as the poet Tu Fu says. You see, Chinese poet breathless air of heights. I want to breathe that, you see, which is why Ramakrishna would look at a picture of the Himalayas and be there. You know, it's a kind of you know, the play of the mountains, isn't it? He's there, he's walking, his disciples come back, tell him about their trip to the Himalayas. He's right there, you see. He was there before it happened, too. All pervasive and existing in everyone and everywhere, that's the Atman, the divine self of mankind. So here we'll take our break and we will uh, uh, stay and stay seated. We'll let the live streaming audience go, and we'll just have a few announcements early here in the SRV Ashram in Portland. I'm gonna stay 15 minutes. We'll be back. <laughs> 